Well, we're coming to the end of our series on the resurrection. And this morning we are going to uh, see how Jesus' resurrection personally impacts every one of our lives through conversion. And uh, it's a fitting topic as we think about New Zealand with only 3% of folks that know Jesus and our own town and our own communities and our own country. Uh, I hope that we can take away from this that God is working and that God changes lives and we can pray for that and look forward to seeing that happen in our families and our friends and our neighbors uh, and in our jobs. Conversion is a term that we use when we talk about going from not believing in Jesus to believing in Jesus. That's really what that means. Uh, Every person who is a Christian goes through this experience, uh, although the experience can be different uh, as how we actually sort of cognitively aware of what's going on. But this morning we're going to see from the Apostle Paul's dramatic conversion how Jesus appeared to him and radically changed the course of his life. I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 9, the red, Bible, red book in front of you, the Bible there is page 777, uh, but, but open up your Bibles and follow along with me. We've got lots of text and I'm not going to put all of it on the screen this morning. We start in uh, Acts chapter 9, and here's what the story goes, or how the story goes of Saul's ama- amazing conversion. It says, meanwhile, Paul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Paul, Paul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Paul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Paul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Paul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there was a man, a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias! Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Paul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all of the harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go! This man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Paul, he said, Brother Paul, the Lord, Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Paul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up, was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. This really is one of the most amazing stories of change, of conversion that you will ever read. Because it starts out with Paul, a passionate, zealous man who believes he has a God-given mission to go into any region he can and take those who believe in this imposter Jesus back to Jerusalem to stand trial for heresy. And he's going to Damascus, a town that is not close, by the way, 135 miles away from Jerusalem. It shows the vast authority that Jerusalem and the leaders of Jerusalem had over the synagogues around them. And he went to the leaders of the synagogues and says, there are people who are in this synagogue in Damascus who are teaching that Jesus is the Messiah. They must be taken out. They must be eradicated. Send me with some men. We will go. We will drag them back to Jerusalem and they will stand trial. And the chief priests of Jerusalem and the leaders say, fine, here's your papers. Go to Damascus, take the Christians, bring them back. We will try them, we'll execute them if we can, we'll imprison them if that's what's necessary. And so Paul goes willingly, joyfully even, knowing this is what God wants for him. You see, Paul's a Pharisee. He believes very firmly in this mission. 
You might recall Pharisees were some of the people that tormented Jesus the most, that rebelled the most against him in his life of ministry. And Paul certainly believed that they did the right thing by having him crucified. And he certainly didn't believe this Jesus rose from the dead. I'm sure he believed that was a conspiracy from these heretics. And so Paul is on his way to D Damascus, fully convinced that this is right. And so for a hundred and some miles, he's traveling to Damascus, fully convinced that this is what God wants him to do. And it says, as he got close, not too far away, suddenly a light from heaven beamed down upon him. And then a voice spoke to him. And it said, Paul, why are you persecuting me? And it's interesting, Paul's response is to say, yes, Lord, who are you? And what's interesting is Paul realized whatever was happening to him in this moment, this voice, this, this personage that he saw was indeed divine. That he was encountering God in some way in this moment. And immediately Jesus says to him, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. And immediately, Jesus takes control of this situation. And this man who was going to persecute him, who was so full of passion to accomplish this, is told, listen, right now, you're sidelined, bud. You need some time to rethink your priorities and what's true. What I want you to do is, yes, go into Damascus. And I want you to wait. I want you to wait until I send someone to you to clarify the situation and to show you what's going to happen in your life from this point on. It's interesting that the people around Paul, there's three, there's three accounts of this, one here and one in chapter 22 and one in chapter 26, where Paul is recounting this in his own words. What's interesting is that the guards, they see the light, but they don't see Jesus. They, they don't hear the voice. They know something amazing has happened. And so when Paul gets up and he realizes he's blind, they take him into Damascus, probably to the house he was prearranged to stay with when he was on his original mission. What I find interesting about this is that only Paul saw Jesus, but these others knew something miraculous was happening around them. And I think about this, and maybe allow me this, this freedom, but I think about how often the gospel is preached to groups of people. And in those groups, the, the same message goes out, the same word is heard, and yet some hear it in the depth of their minds and their hearts and their souls, and they respond, and they trust in Christ, and their life is changed, and others are still waiting for that event to happen. The same sort of situation here is going on, that these men that were accompanying Paul saw something miraculous, but their lives were not changed, only Paul's was. And so Paul is left blind by this encounter. He's helpless. Here, this man with so much competency and capability and, and passion and ability is now going, you know, it's interesting, he was going to persecute the way. It's what the early part of Acts talks about is the Christians were the people of the way, the people who believed in the Messiah. But now he needs someone else to show him the way, right, to where he's going to go. And he goes into this house, and the text says that for three days he drinks and eats nothing. I think implied by this, and if you look at how he talks about this time from those other, those other descriptions of this event, I think Paul really is sitting before Jesus and saying, what have I done? What does all of this mean? And I think this is really his moment of conversion as he sits there and he thinks about the fact that I was persecuting Jesus, and now I have met the risen Lord. And he is indeed the Messiah, what does that mean for my life? What does that mean for what I have done? And what does it mean going forward? In fact, the guy's blind, right? So you can imagine that there's also this desperate dependence upon God calling out to him to say, I really don't want to be blind. I'd like to be healed of my sight. I don't know what all of this means, but you can imagine for these three days as he fasted, as he prayed, as he confessed his sins, as he confessed the harm he inflicted upon others, as he confessed his disbelief, and now as he repents and turns to Jesus to believe that he is indeed the Messiah, that there was a profound change that was going on in his heart as God was working in him. And I think, you know, if we put this into modern times, it's, it's imagining someone like the most angry atheist that you might have read or know turning to faith. It's like the persecutors in China all of a sudden saying, we believe in Jesus and we're going to let the Christians go. 
It's that dramatic. It's that amazing. It's like the worst, the person you think is most opposed to Christianity all of a sudden becoming a fervent believer in Christ. It's an amazing transformation. It's an amazing conversion. And what happens to Paul at this moment is regeneration by the work of God when he accepted Christ as his savior. And I want to talk about this because it's important that we understand these theological terms and what's going on here. Because what is regeneration? Well, it's the moment when God imparts new spiritual life to those who profess faith in Jesus. Amen. It happens at the same time of conversion, but it's the work of God to bring us to that point when we can trust in Christ. And we see here that it's a supernatural act of Paul's life. Look, Paul was going not with the intention to turn to Jesus. He was going with the intention to eradicate this heresy from the world. And it's at that moment God met him. It's that moment he appeared and Paul looks at him and Jesus says, hey, you're doing this wrong. You've not got the right end of this. You need to change. And it's God's work in him to bring him to faith. And it's evident by the actions that he then starts to live out. And so Paul's conversion, Paul's regeneration changes him from living opposed to God to living for God. And we see evidence of Paul's conversion of his regeneration by the actions he takes, right? He obeys Jesus. He goes to Damascus. He waits for Ananias to come. His attitude has changed from living against Christ and opposing him to living for Jesus and want to tell others about him. Paul has faith in Jesus as the Messiah, and because of that, his life is changed forever. Now, when we look at this story, we can say, well, that's so dramatic. It's so different than mine. And yes, absolutely. We are told that this is the last uh, resurrection appearance of Jesus in scriptures, and so, yes, we're not going to see Jesus risen like Paul has. That, that time has ended. But the reality is the fundamental things that happened to Paul are the same fundamental things that happen to each and every one of us who trust in Jesus. That's what conversion, that's what regeneration does for all of us. And so when we place our faith and trust in Jesus, this regeneration has taken place in our hearts. It's the work that God does to prepare our hearts to turn to him in humility to say, Lord, I need to be forgiven given for my sins. I recognize I'm a sinner. I know that you've saved me. I need your work in my life to help me know and follow you. It's interesting in John 1, 12 through 13, he talks about how we become believers because of God's decision. He says, yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. And this first, it, I think here you have both regeneration and conversion talked about, right? What is the conversion aspect? It's the believing in Jesus where we consciously say, I believe, but what has gone on behind it? God has regenerated. God has chosen. God has picked us to be his children. As he says clearly, it's not the human decision, the husband's will, natural descent, but it's God's choice to save us and bring us into relationship with him. And that's necessary because of our fallen nature, our natural inclination to be opposed to the things of God, to be God unto ourselves ourselves, and God must work in our hearts and minds to turn us from that self-dependence and that self-trust to say, I need someone else, and I'm going to reach out and find that God who loves sinners, as we sang about this morning. And so while conversion and regeneration happen at the same time, I believe that regeneration comes first as God pulls us in, and we see the need, and we respond in conversion. But what regeneration really does is it produces a new understanding of who God is and a closeness of relationship with him that was impossible before. And so before we come to faith, we really cannot understand the message of salvation. So God must work in our hearts and minds to reveal who Jesus is, to show us our need that we might respond. It's interesting, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul is writing, and he uses this very vivid imagery to talk about how we're blinded before faith. He says, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let sh light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. It's a very descriptive thing, but doesn't it sound a little bit like Paul's experience on the road to Damascus? That he was blind, spiritually blind, 
about who Jesus was. And he has this vision of Christ. The light comes, the voice comes, and he says, out of his darkness, Christ shone into his life and removed that blindness from him that he might know spiritually who Christ is, that he might know spiritually what it means to know Jesus and be in relationship with God. And so that's that work of regeneration, that, that God comes into hearts and minds that are blinded, that are opposed to him, and gives us this clarity of sight to see Jesus is the one we must trust in. Regeneration inclines in our hearts to obey God and, and turn from sin. And the reality is that God is working in us to say, hey, I'm going to love you, I'm going to follow you, I'm going to serve you in this world. And then, of course, working together with regeneration is conversion. And conversion is that our decision, our conscious decision to trust in Jesus, our Savior. And if you think about it, regeneration and conversion are like two sides of a coin, right? They make up the same sort of thing, and they go together. But conversion is that choice that I make, that you make, that says, I believe in Jesus. I believe he died for me. I believe he rose again. I believe he forgave my sins. I believe he gave me his righteousness so I could be a child of God. And when that happens to us, you know, I made that decision when I was a little kid. I did it several times after seeing the Left Behind movies because I just wanted to make sure I wasn't going to be left behind. <laughs> but the reality was is this recognition that I'm a sinner, that I don't want to go to hell, that I don't want to be apart from God, that I want to live in relationship with God. And that even my little mind believed in Jesus that he was the only way. And of course, that under depth of understanding grew over time. And it's still growing, if I'm honest, about what it means to truly know and follow Christ. But that, that, that desire to say, I want to know Jesus and be his disciple. I want to know Jesus and follow him. I want to know Jesus and know God and be in relationship with him. And so it's the act of turning towards God in faith and trusting that he died for me, he forgave my sins. Now, while... There's a moment in a person's life when they're regenerated and convert, converted. The reality is that can look different for some of us. It could be kind of like me where I can look back and sort of vaguely pinpoint that moment where I heard a preacher and I prayed with my parents. That's sort of a moment for me. But others, there's sort of a gener there can be a process where you go through that. I think especially kids in Christian homes, you're gratefully and thankfully surrounded by the truth and you sort of gradually come into this moment where you believe. But the reality is at some moment in your life, you've gone from not trusting in Christ to trusting in Christ. You've been regenerated. You've been converted. And if you don't have a set time for that, the key thing is to say, well, what do you believe now? And if you're believing in who Jesus is and what he's done for you, you're trusting in him, you can give confidence that you're a child of God and that God is with you. What's interesting, then, is what we see happens in Paul's life, that the changes that come at regeneration and conversion, they really set us on a path of discipleship. Look with me again at Acts. We'll start at verse 19 again and go through verse 30, where we see Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus. He sees the risen Christ, but it also radically changes the nature and the course of his life. He says this, Paul, or Saul spent several days with his disciples in Damascus, or with the disciples in Damascus. I suppose I should say one thing about this. Uh, Paul and Saul, he had that name all the time, by the way. Uh, Saul would have been his Jewish name, and Paul would have been a name that he would have used in more of the Greek-speaking world. So uh, some people say after he was converted, he became Paul. That's not really true. That would have been the name he would have had at the same time. He goes by Paul mostly, and he writes because he's writing generally to a mixed audience of Jews and Gentiles, and so that's the reason. Saul, of course, you might remember, would have been a name from the king of Israel and probably was a very popular name at the time. So our text goes on to say, Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once, he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All who heard him were astonished and asked, is it that he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on his name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Christ. After many days had gone by, the Jews conspired to kill him, but Saul learned of their plan. Day and night, they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. But his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord, and the Lord had spoken to him, and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. 
So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated with the Grecian Jews, but they tried to kill him. When the brothers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. What's fascinating about this is, is, is Paul has this experience with Jesus. He spends three days fasting. When Ananias comes to him, he says, brother, right? He tells him you've been called to go into the world to preach the gospel. And then Paul, with this new understanding that Jesus really is the Messiah, goes into those very synagogues where he had letters probably still in hand to take the Christians in way. And I'm sure the synagogue leaders are a little bit confused because instead of saying, hey, we're going to round up anyone who believes in Jesus and take them back, he says, hey, they're right. That wasn't the plan. If, if Justice is the guy he was going to meet, Justice may have taken him aside and going, hey, Paul, you're kind of going off script here. This isn't what I was told was going to happen. This isn't what these letters mean. Do I need to now arrest you and take you with the rest of them back to Jerusalem? And Paul says, well, you can do what you want to do, but I believe Jesus is the Messiah, and here's why. I saw him on the road. And as I look at scriptures and I look at what I was teaching and what we had dreamed and hoped for, I realized that Jesus did fulfill this. And he really is the Messiah that has come. And so it's not hard to imagine that Justice might have left that conversation to whoever else he was, he, he was expecting Saul to take these annoying Christians and heretics away, getting together and saying, this man, I don't know what to do. And when someone whispers and says, perhaps we just kill him. And then it was done with. And then these other guys can take care of the orders to take these Christians out of here. And, and then we're free of this. Remember, Paul was pretty happy when Stephen was stoned. So I, maybe that's the action we take. And that's exactly what they did, is they were going to kill him. And the Christians who were there realizing that God really had done something amazing, take him and lower him down from the wall that he might escape. And then he goes to Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, he comes up to them, and they know who this man is. He is a well-known persecutor. And they're a little skeptical as well. Wait, wait, wait. This has got to be a trap, right? You know, one of the best ways you can do this is infiltrate us by pretending to be one of us. The Trojan Paul, if you will, perhaps. <laughs> he comes, and Barnabas, encouraged by God to do this, stands up and says, wait, 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 wait. This man's legit. He's real. He's telling you the truth. I've heard that in Damascus, he preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. They were going to kill him, and the Christians helped him escape, and he's come back to us, and God has radically changed his life and given him this message to preach the gospel. You see how clearly and powerfully he can do this. And so they welcome him into the church, but it's interesting, some there, the Grecian Jews, they still were not happy with this plan, and they try to kill him. And so the believers in Jerusalem, much like the believers in Damascus, say, Paul needs a cooling off period. <laughs> he needs to become less radioactive to the people around us. And so they take him to Caesarea and send him back home, trusting that God will work in his life as he goes back there and that his mission to the Gentiles will be accomplished somehow. But what we see in this is this life change of his that he goes from persecutor to apostle. He goes from a person that has a new life purpose to proclaim the good news of Jesus, to go into the world and to preach this good news. And what's interesting, of course, is he was a man that was persecuting others, and now he's one that's going to be beaten and attempted to be murdered and suffer greatly throughout his ministry of that Christ has given him to share this gospel. He's one who was violent and was willing to kill others for his cause, and yet he became merciful and loving and gracious, wanting to see all come to faith in Christ. What a radical life change that is. He was a proud Pharisee and became a humble servant of Jesus. When we look at Paul's life, and very dramatic, of course, but the reality is that all of us are on this same path of discipleship where God is working in our lives to help us become more like Jesus in our character and in our purpose for living. And so we can learn from the story of Paul's conversion that we're called to grow in our character as we humble ourselves before Jesus, right? To go from someone who's violent to someone who's loving is an amazing gift that God has given. 
And you can imagine as you read Paul talking that, that this took time, that God was working in his heart, that I'm sure anger was an issue he had to control and learn and mature through. I'm sure that, that he was a person that had to continue to grow as we see he even talks about this in his own texts. The reality is, is that God worked in his life to change him and God is working in every one of our lives who believe in him to change us as well. And so as regenerated persons, we will experience this pull, this tug of God in our lives to want to become more like Jesus in our attitudes and our thoughts and our actions. And so we need to examine our hearts and say, is there a desire in me to be like Jesus or not? Because that's a fundamental reality of this change that has happened. Now, it's not going to be perfect longing. There's going to be temptations that come along. There's going to be seasons of our life where we're much more willing and desiring to do this, and then life wears on us, and sin wears on us, and we struggle. But the reality is there's an insistent pull to say, I want to love Jesus, and I want to follow Jesus, and I want to become more like him. Amen. And when we do sin, when we do fail, it's to say, Lord, I've messed up. I've sinned. Come, I, I come to you and ask you to change me, ask you to forgive me, ask me to be, help me become what you want me to be. The path of discipleship is also a calling to serve God and our fellow human beings by sharing the gospel of Jesus. Paul immediately went and started proclaiming this Jesus and what he is and what he's done. And we're called to do the same things. Because the reality is, is that folks around us are dying a spiritual death. And we have that antibiotic that will cure them, that will save them. And we're to go to them and to, to, to tactfully and lovingly but truthfully say, Jesus loves you. Jesus died for you. You need to trust in him. And, and as we think about you know, a country like New Zealand, how did it get to that point? Well, yes, a lot of influx of other people. But my guess is at some point along the way, the Christian church lost the passion to share with their neighbors and their friends. And, and now they're rekindling that, praise God. And we can be a part of that by partnering with our missionaries there. But we need to pray and ask that God doesn't allow that to happen in our own country. That it happens because our neighbors and our children and our family and our coworkers don't know. They don't have the opportunity to believe. That we're not, perhaps not praying enough and taking the opportunities that are there to say, who does Jesus want to convert today? Who does Jesus want to change their life? And again, I come back to this, and we can say it's a huge task. It's a daunting task. Don't you see the trajectory of the world? Stop listening to all that stuff and look at your neighbor. Yeah. You're right. You're not going to change everything at the top, but you can change something next door. Actually, you can't. God can, but he'll use you to change that person next door. So we've got to stop thinking of all the national tragedy that's going on and start looking at our friends and our neighbors and the people that God has actually put into your life to love and care and speak truth to and say, that's my field. And if these people come to Jesus and they trust in him and they start making decisions based upon who Christ is and what he's doing, we'll see change at the top. But it never works top down. It doesn't. It works bottom up as God changes lives. And so this is the calling of our life is to go into these places and to share the gospel with our neighbors, our friends, our coworkers, to pray fervently and passionately, Lord, show me how to do this. Would you be working in their lives? If we really believe that God regenerates, we have to be praying that he'll do that work and lay that groundwork. And so when we meet with people and we talk with them, that he's doing that and that he'll bring this change into their lives. So the path of discipleship means that we serve God by sharing the gospel. The path of discipleship involves the encouragement and support of other Christians. I love how this, in two times in this story, right? First is Ananias, right? He's, he's blind. He doesn't know what's going to happen. His whole world has been changed. And God sent a fellow brother to him to encourage and to strengthen him and to heal him and to show him, listen, what you saw was real. Your life really is different now. You saw me in the vision that I was coming. I'm Ananias. I want you to know this Jesus that I know. And, and I want to encourage you that God has given you this mission and this task to now be a preacher and to share this good news with the world. And then second, he, he, he has to flee and he goes into Jerusalem and it's another brother, Barnabas, who comes alongside and says, I know you guys have every right to be skeptical of Paul. Paul. 